All right, uh, third speaker of the afternoon is Jessica Finson speaking on representations of theatric groups for non-experts. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to be at the IES, at least remotely. Um, and thanks for the opportunity to speak here. So I will talk about representations of PID groups, but I don't assume that you know what a PID group is. Uh, so this is aimed, as I was asked, for, to aim it at non-experts. So if you're a number theorist or representation theorist, I encourage you to attend my talk next week in the number theory seminar. And you can go and make a tea now or take a nap. So I want to begin by telling you what, what the periodic groups are. So I should tell you first what, what P is. So P is a prime numbers like 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, choose your favorite prime number. And so I should first tell you what the periodic numbers are in order to tell you what periodic groups are. So you all hopefully know what the real numbers are. These are just the completion of the rational numbers with respect to all this, they're not absolute value. And the idea is now that we can take a completion of the rational numbers with respect to a periodic absolute value instead, where the periodic absolute value is as follows. Oh, this should be an equal sign. I don't know. The resolution isn't great. Sorry, I'm improving that. I hope you can see this now. So the periodic absolute value, absolute value of an integer p to the s times r, where p and s are co-prime, is 1 over p to the s. So it measures how often an integer is divisible by p. The more often it's divisible by p, the smaller is the periodic absolute value. And then we just take the completion, which means that in periodic numbers of the following form, it's a power series in p where we allow finitely many negative exponents. So it's a minus n to the p minus n and so on, plus a0 plus a1 times p, a2 times p squared, plus so on. And we can go to, um, to infinity here because the higher the exponent of p, the smaller the number. So this, the series will converge. Uh, and so the, the big difference between the reals and periodic numbers is, is the resulting topology. So if you try to picture the real numbers, you draw a real line. But if you try to picture the periodic numbers, you end up with a fractal. So these, what I've drawn here, these are the periodic integers. So all those power series, was, so the actual power series, so when we don't have negative exponents here. And then all these are the periodic integers. And if you um, look at the first digit, A0, this would tell you in which of the triangles you are. If you look at the second digit, it tells you which of the smaller triangles you're in. And so the very interesting thing is that while the real line is connected, the periodic numbers, they are totally disconnected. So it's very different. And one of the key differences that results from it is that if you look at the real numbers, then there's only one compact subgroup and addition, which is the trivial one. Because if you take, for example, the number one in, the comp in a subgroup, then the number two is in it, three is in it, and so on. So it can never be compact. But on the other hand, for the periodic numbers, there are infinitely many compact open subgroups. So there are CPs, the, the periodic integers, where you don't have negative exponents in this power series, in this normal series, um, and P times CP, which corresponds to the smaller triangular P times P to the 15 times CP and all, and so on. All these are compact open subgroups. In particular, we have a basis of the identity formed by compact open subgroups. And that makes a huge difference when studying these objects. So they behave very differently. And so I promised to tell you what PID groups are. So first we call what Lie groups are. So real Lie, algebraic Lie groups, I hope you've encountered them before. They are, for example, GLN over the real numbers or SLN, those matrices that determine in one, or SON, those that preserve an inner product, or SP2 and those that preserve in symplectic form. And now, what are the periodic groups? These are just the same, except you substitute the real numbers by the periodic numbers. So you take GLN, uh, the invertible matrices, but with entries in the periodic field, or SLN, or SON, or SP2N, or your favorite, favorite basically Lie group now over the periodic numbers. Um, I want to introduce one more bit of, um, of notation, not notation, one more, um, one more thought. So on the one hand, one can consider periodic numbers. And the question that I often get by people not working in number theory is, what is the characteristic of the periodic numbers? And let's look at it. So the number P is non-zero. So that means, the and all other prime numbers are non-zero as well. So that means the characteristic of this field is zero. But there is another field that's very closely related to it. And maybe you find it easier to think about that than about the periodic numbers, depending on where you come from. And these are, this is the field of the Noor series 
over a finite field with p elements. So that means, again, you take these, these normal series or power series where you add finitely many negative exponents to it, uh, where you now ask the coefficients to be in the finite field with p elements, so basically, again, numbers between 0 and p minus 1, but this time, instead of having exponents of p, we just take a dummy variable t and take power series or more precisely lower series in this variable t. And this field now has characteristic p because p is equal to 0 and is equal to this a0 here. So that means these, these two fields have different characteristics, but they are very similar. Like both look like these power series or rather lower series. Um, so they behave very similar. We call them both local fields. And whenever I talk about periodic groups, I mean either the periodic groups I introduced before, so GLN over the periodic numbers, SLN, or so on over the periodic numbers, or alternatively allow you to plug in into GLN, SLN, and so on, the field of Laurent series over finite field. So when I talk about periodic groups, um, you can choose any of these groups, or if, if you're more advanced, you can also choose exceptional group, whatever crazy group you can up, come up with. All right, and now I told you that I want to talk about representations of these groups. So we should move on to the representation theory. So from now on, G is a periodic group. So it's one of the groups you've seen on the slide before. And let me remind you that the representation of a group is just a group homomorphism from this group into the automorphism of a vector space, V. This vector space can be either a complex vector space or in line with a special program this year, I also allow mod L coefficients as long as L is a prime number different from P. And the representation that I consider are usually infinite dimensional. And so the big goal motivation for a lot of mathematicians in this area is to construct all representations of the periodic group. So we have seen all kinds of different representations appearing, so for example, algebraic representations. So I should tell you what representations I work with. And I put in the adjective smooth. So I put in irreducible just to mean this representation has precisely two sub-representations, the trivial one and the representation itself. So it's a building block because we just focus on building blocks for now. And I put in the adjective smooth. And smooth means that the stabilizer of every vector in this vector space V contains an open subgroup. So that means every vector is stabilized by something rather large. And that means that the representation itself, while it's still infinite dimension, is something we can actually work with and we get a nice category to work with. And so these are the representations I like to study. And why do I want to study them? Because there are many applications. Well, not only because of that, also because I'm a mathematician and I just like to study them. But there are also plenty of applications um, within the representation theory and also to various areas of number theory. So this is only a 50 minute talk. I won't tell you many more details because I could just spend all the 15 minutes talking about it, but I'm happy to tell you more about it afterwards or also next week. So what I want to do now is to talk about how we construct these representations, or rather what do we know about the construction of these representations. And I want to focus on the construction of the building blocks, which are called supercuspular representations, or mod L, they are called also cuspular representations. So everything I'm going to tell you about basically works also mod L, but I just focus on the complex number for exposition. So these supercuspular representations, if you haven't heard the word before, just means building blocks. These are very mysterious and difficult to write down. So in the case of GLN, we, we know luckily everything by now. I mean, by everything I mean, we know how to write down these representations. It started more than 50 years ago by work of Howe and Moy and was finished by Bushnell and Kutzko more than 25 years ago. If we try to do this for general groups, for all the, all the periodic groups at the same time, it's getting much more complicated. And I want to talk about this now. So the construction of these representations started with work of Moy and Howe, who introduced the notion of depth, which is an invariant they attach to a representation, which can be either to zero or a positive real number, which I draw down here. And so this somehow measures uh, the complexity of the representation, the higher it is, the some of the more complicated it is. And I want to draw in this direction the prime number p because some results depend on what the prime number p is. And so Moy and Brissett and also Morris, they showed how to construct these depth zero representations. They related these representations to representations of finite group of Lie time. And then the next question was, of course, one question is to study these representations of finite, um, representations of finite groups of Lie type, which is a big problem in its own. 
Another question is how to go deeper down here, how to find representation of higher depth. So this started this work of Adler in 1998 and was generalized vastly by JKU. And the construction that JKU gave is a construction that basically everyone who works with explicit construction nowadays works with because it's the most general construction we have to date. So that on the other hand means that people are interested in knowing when does the construction by JKU provide us all representations because then we can just prove results about the JKU's representations, which are rather, not, I shouldn't say easy to write down, but which have a nice recipe to, to write them down. And so Julie Kim actually proved that if the prime is very large, so if we are in this region here, then we get all the representation from JKU's construction. So that means everything we prove for JKU's construction holds true in full generality. Fortunately, she had to assume that the field is QP, so we are not allowed to use the neural series of our finite field here. But nevertheless, this was already a great result because now, now we could use, con use construction to prove general results. Moving forward, you might wonder if use construction gives us everything. And Mark Nieder and JKU, they constructed something which they called epipelagic representations. I've circled these representations here that they constructed and they called them epipelagic because Mark Nieder explained to me that he thinks of a representation as a fish that swims in an ocean. So he thinks that we have a big ocean of representations that have to find all these weird creatures in here. And the upper zone of the ocean, that's called the epipelagic zone. That's the zone that can be reached by sunlight. And the representations that they constructed are close to the surface up here. And what they did is they said, okay, take a certain input. And then once we have the input, the output are these nice epipelagic representations, the output of their construction. But they could only prove the input exists for large primes P. And so what I've done partially in joint work with Beth Romano is to show that actually the input exists also for small primes P. And the result is that we obtain new representations here that were not yet constructed by JKU. So that means use construction doesn't give us all representation in full generality. So there's more out there. There's something else we have to do. On the other hand, a very natural question to ask is, so when do we get all the representations? And it turns out that if P is large, not just very large, it's, that suffices to get all representations. So we only need actually a very minor assumption on P to get exhaustion. And moreover, you notice I, I had this condition here that the field has to be QP, but actually we can remove this condition. We can also work with the whole series of our finite field. Um, so the statement is that if P is large, we get everything from use construction. And by P large, the precise statement is that P doesn't divide the order of the while group, which means that for, for example, for GLN, P is larger than N. And so this is a result that actually last time I was at the IS, I stated this result as an expected result, except I didn't include the, um, the removal of the condition on the field yet. I only included the exhaustion for P is large. But I stated it as an expected result because I, I thought I had a proof, but I hadn't written up the proof yet. And so unfortunately, shortly after I gave the talk, I realized that my proof relied on some results in the literature. But when I tried to read the proof of these results in the literature, they seemed not to work. So I had a pretty tough summer where I tried to fix all the literature and make everything work. So the nice thing is now I can actually state it as a theory. It's a real theory now, um, and I managed to, to survive the summer. And now I claim it is a, it is a theory. Uh, unfortunately, there was another problem that arose, which people, in, in contrast to my summer problems, which no one was aware of, people became aware of some other troubles, which is that unfortunately, use proof that his construction gives us supercustom representation doesn't work. So what do I mean by this? More precisely, use proof that his construction provides us with supercustom representations, which everyone who works with this construction assumes because we want to work with supercustom representations. This proof relies on a statement in the literature that contained a typo. And the typo was, it was like from these old days where I think mathematicians wrote papers by hand, gave them to a secretary who typed it. And I guess the secretary forgot to put in a plus minus one. So all that was missing was a plus minus one. But if you put a plus minus one into the statement, then JKU's proof breaks down completely. So his main lemma on which everything relies turns out to be false. I provided a counter example for this. So the mathematicians started to get worried, more and more worried. 
But luckily, I, I managed to prove that we don't have to worry. Use construction still yields supercuspidal representations. So everything is safe. All the results are still valid. So that means this is now actually the current state of the art. And moreover, I also ex expect that the, the bound where we get exhaustion here, that the assumption that P is large is optimal in general. So that means what remains to be done and which is my current and future work in progress is to find out what this big question mark is here. What else is there? We know there's more and we need to find out what else is there. And that's what I want to work on while at the IES and most likely also much longer than just the time at the IES. And I also hope to profit from the special year at the IES and broaden a bit and learn more, start new research projects with others. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a question. Sure. Oh, let me increase the volume. Sorry, I decreased it for the previous speaker. Yep, go ahead. Is there a sense in which Harishandra's discrete series picture is emerging in any of this? Uh, uh, in, in the real case, he has a complete description of the analog of supercuspidal. Um, the, the description, yeah, is more complicated, but is there any, is there any, uh, connection between the two? So, as far as I know, the picture is very different because the groups behave very differently, except that, um, as, as Tasha Kalitha observed, if you write down the, the character formulas, try to write down the local Langlands correspondence for the shallow elements, they, they seem to align very well, uh, but only, only in the special case, if you look at, uh, at very regular supercuspital representations, uh, in which case you, you can reduce things to, to a torus more or less. And then also to be precise, one should twist use construction, which is a whole new topic to, to be explored, which I might talk a bit more about next week. Even in this, uh, in your picture of the ocean <laughs> near the top, even there, there's no close connection. I mean, I think the, so I would have to look more precisely at what you, your, the pictures that you have in mind, but my, my first intuition is that this picture is very different because the, the depth, I mean, the reason where the depth comes from is that we have our filtrations by compact open subgroups getting smaller and smaller, and you try to see how far you go down to have fixed vectors, which in the real cases, it's, it's, so the approach is very different. You don't have this picture in the real, real case. Yeah, thanks. Any other questions for the speaker? I have a question. So when P is not sufficiently large, what's a example I should think of, of a representation that doesn't come from this construction? Um. So when P is very large, all the representations come from that construction. It's not very large. Is there a specific example that I can think about of something that? Um, yeah, so I, I could even write one down if I had a blackboard. <laughs> um, so basically the idea, so what you could do is, okay, so that's a bit tricky, but the, the idea is that JK, you cannot work with wired tori. Um, so if you just take a torus that is wild, so a torus that doesn't split over tamely ramified extension, uh, and take a nice character of that torus, um, extend it to a sufficiently large compact open subgroup, and then induce, then you get a representation that doesn't come from JKU's construction. So the main obstruction is basically that JKU can only work with tori that split over tame extension. So I could write down on a blackboard, or if I share an iPad later, an explicit example if you like. Any other questions for the speaker? All right, let's uh, thank her again.